So um, how to be single? You know, you're talking about the script was fun, and how big is doing a script like this? I mean, like how big is? Because you can have like a really bad movie. Let's just take the general history of film composing. Mm-hmm. You can have an okay movie, but the score is phenomenal. So, right. I mean, does it almost matter to you what the genre is or what the story is, what who's involved, who's attached? Well, uh, they all matter. I mean, the genre less so than anything else. I'm not. I'm certainly not. You know, more comfortable in one genre than the next. I'm comfortable with whether it's any good or not. You know, um, which is down to the script and the characters and absolutely who's involved. But the bottom line is, you know, I came in really towards the tail end of the process with this movie, as I often do. And, you know, what they had was just a really good, solid, um, pretty complete movie by the time I got to it. And, you know, it really is fun. I mean, it's just got great performances, a great script, you know. So doing something like that isn't... it's None of it's hard anyway. I love doing this for a living, so it's not like... You know, I'd be lying if I said I went to work every day. How does this come to you? Uh, how did I first get involved in it? I think the first, first I heard about it was through my friend Susan Kent, who's the music supervisor on the show. And uh, she, um, she and I had talked about it, for, you know, for a while. We'd worked together previously. And, and, uh, and then the guys at New Line sent me the script, and I just, you know, I loved it. It was, it was genuinely funny it's, there's not many scripts you read comedy scripts that really make you spit your coffee across the room but this was one of them and for the folks that don't know the plot of the film is about what's it about you have dakota johnson trying to be single how's that play out? well she's i don't want to give anything away but she's you know let's just say it's about her i suppose it's somewhat of a coming of age story in a very small way but it's it's really about her life in new york over the space of you know a, a year or so, and kind of finding out who she is, I think, and all the pitfalls associated with that, which is obviously the fun of it. And that that part I can identify with because I sort of spent a couple of years in New York doing something pretty similar. So um, it was fun to it was fun to see that up on the screen, you know, with some very typically New York, typically New York uh, pratfalls associated with it. Have you spent a lot of time in New York? Because I imagine going there to feel the to compose a New York film, you want to try to get the atmosphere included in the music somehow. Yeah, I mean, I think that's something that's pretty much embedded into my DNA now. Anyway, I've spent a lot of time in New York in my life, and uh, yeah, most most of it was done here in LA and in a very short amount of time. You saw the movie, and then you went to work. So, what's your um, creative process in in composing the music, writing the music, scoring the music for it? Well, I mean, every film's different, and, you know, every film has its own quirks. There are films that, you know, there are films that I'm doing now where I'm on very early in the process. There are films like this where I come in right at the end. But the, but the, if there's a common thread, it's usually that I try and find the themes that I'm going to use throughout the score first. And, you know, there's not a ton of score in this movie. There's a lot of songs. And when Christian, the director, came to me first, he basically said the score in this movie has to be the heart of Alice, which is Dakota Johnson's character. It's got to be the emotion and the heart of her character. So really the main thing was finding a theme for her. And that was the first thing, and usually I do that away from picture. I watch the film, sort of absorb how I feel about it, and then, and, and what was fun actually was I went to a test screening of the film to see it for the first time. And uh, so I, I got to see it with an audience that absolutely loved the film. The, the film was scoring you know, super, super high from the very beginning. And uh, it was really great. I mean, I'd encourage people to see it at the theaters rather than just, you know, at home on TV because it's it's great seeing it with the crowd. It's almost like a, a live performance. Um, you know, so that's kind of what I did is I watched the film. I went away, wrote some themes, and, you know, pretty much the first theme that I sat down and played for Christian seemed to resonate with everybody, and we, we took it from there. And then just were you surprised, like, you did Empire. Yeah, you do Empire. Right, and still doing it, yeah. Right, right. I mean, were you surprised when you get that? Because that's mostly like hip-hop kind of Yeah, music. I mean, to be honest, when I first got the call, I sort of went, I think I'm the right guy. Because, you know, I, I didn't, you know, I'm, as much as I love hip-hop, and I, and I do, you know, I mean, I think um, Straight Outta Compton is the best, I think it's the best punk album ever made. Mm. I think it's it's just pure, you know, 
I, I bet the Sex Pistols wish they'd made that record, but um, but uh, um, I did sort of wonder a little bit. And but then when I when I kind of got you know talking to uh, Lee Daniels and everybody behind the project, I realised why they wanted to get me in was because they wanted a very cinematic orchestral score, mm-hmm. which is you know a lot of what I've done over the years. Um, and they wanted to do something that was more akin to a sort of old gangster movie than than just plaster the whole thing in wall to wall hip hop. So again, it's another one of those situations where there's a lot of songs. But the score serves a very specific purpose, you know. Also, if you're just tuning in, we're talking to uh, Phil Eisler. He's the composer of the new film, How to Be Single, as well as Empire and Revenge, amongst other shows. Was film scores a part of your life ever at all? And if if so, like even now, even if it wasn't before, now, do you ever listen back on other old film scores or watch old movies and pay attention to the scoring? Is is there something to learn from the past? Always. Yeah. There's something to learn from everything, man. Mm-hmm. There's no, you know... I think you're a fool if you don't if you don't see the learning potential in every single piece of music you hear, whether you like it or not. Um, but I, I mean, film schools were always part of my life. You know, look, it's impossible for it's as impossible for John Williams to to have not been part of your life as it was impossible for the Beatles to not have been part of your life. Mm-hmm. Um, that's more of a case of popular culture, I think, than being into film scoring. But um, I think the music that I grew up with. You know, like I said, which a lot of it was rooted in the 60s and 70s, um, even though, you know, that was kind of before my time, that I think I I often thought of scoring movies. I think that my earliest memories of writing music um, when I was very, very young, it was always something that was accompanied by images as far as I was concerned, whether that was a movie or whether that was, you know, just something in my head. Um, you know, I remember listening to McCartney's first solo record a lot when I was a kid. And there are tracks on there that I, I always imagined as a film score, basically. You know, yeah. um, and as I got more into it, um, and as I sort of came back to studying classical music, I think film scores became an inevitable part of that. And I think more older, old film scores rather than you know what's around now. I think what's around now you're going to encounter when you go to the movies every day. Um, although there are, you know, some super talented composers around it's not that I, I'm sort of decrying their music in any way I just think the stuff that I end up looking at and you know where for instance I want to study the orchestration or or the method you know how they did it tends to look to the past because it's just so much more interesting to me to figure out mm-hmm. what Franz Waxman did or what Steiner did or, or what you know John Williams did or, or Herman in a day when everything was sort of very manual and very based around your composer being extremely capable in, mm. in every way. Um, I think composers now have to be capable in a whole range of different things, you know, from computers to all kinds of stuff, to, you know, being a therapist and a priest and a rabbi. Um, but uh, I think, you know, that that's definitely sort of an era that's probably more interesting to me in terms of studying. You think, uh, what do you think are the, you brought up, when you bring that up, you think of what's the difference, the method of composing music changed um, in the tools you use. How has it changed? Well, I'm, you're bringing that up. Yeah. You, you bring that up. And I'm thinking, is there anything, does the technology that you use ever kind of inhibit composing music that's more original? Yes. In okay. a word, yes. I think it can be a help and a hindrance depending on, you know, depending on a how well you know the tools, I think if you're going to use a sequencer, you need to it needs to be as familiar to use your your main instrument. Mm. You know, it needs to kind of be an instrument. Um, if you're really going to write music for it, if you're just using it as a sketch pad, it's kind of limiting because you know, for instance, you don't always want to write music to a click track. I mean, sometimes that's appropriate, sometimes it isn't. And if you're going to write that way, you've got to know how to do it with a computer because if everything's fixed to a grid, it can make certain kinds of music very unmusical, mm. particularly when you're writing for an orchestra. But in a, in a lot of different situations, and actually Help Me Single is a good example of that, there were a lot of cues that had a very rubato sort of feel to them and were very spaced out and would have been really difficult to write those just to a straight click track because it just, you know, it takes your mind into a completely different headspace. So... So in that sense, yeah, I think it, I, I think there are times you need to be able to step away from the computer, and there are times that I think it's very helpful. <laughs> well, I I it's like any piece of technology. There's good and bad, you know. Mm. It, it's 
it's like the way people talk about the latest evolutionary steps in virtual reality. You know, like maybe years from now, not well, who knows? Maybe a year or two years from now, we're going to be having, we're going to be in a situation where FaceTime goes into something more 3D and holographic. And you know, part of me says, nah, people are already, you know, so glued to their phones that that can't be too good. That's going to disconnect us. But then at the same time, you know, think about the person that maybe has a sick relative that they can't get to physically and, you know, mm. they have a chance to actually connect. So I think there's a good and bad side to technology and auto-tune's no different. You know, I think it sucks the way that... It's not that auto-tune's a bad thing inherently. I mean, you know, if imagine you've got a great vocal performance, but if you could just tweak that one bit, you know, okay, sure, whatever. But that very easily becomes this sort of, you know, downward spiral of pro-tooling everything to death. And, and I think... That's why every record on the air has sounded the same for, you know, in whatever style is the fashion you know, of the moment for a long, long time. And I don't think that's that different from any time in history. I think any time something's successful, people try and copy it. It's just, you know, the, the way it's churned out and has been for a long time, and this is even before Autotune, I think the 80s are a big culprit in this too, is that, you know, it just became, I think listening got, a little bit dumbed down at some point from listening to what music actually sounds like when people are playing it to this sort of perfect puzzle where everything is shoehorned into a into a sort of a mold. And I think especially now, I couldn't tell you one, you know, one sort of teen pop record from the next. Um, yeah, and I just think that's bloody boring. Yeah, I can understand that. I mean, you look at the fads, how they just, you, you're telling look at like these teen bands, that come and go like the Jones Brothers between um the oh my god who's in uh oh my god who's the new guys the new, the the ones that I are, I wouldn't have a clue mate I'm I'm really I'm so out of that scene you know and the thing is what what what's really sad about it I think is it's not like there's no craft or no artistry that goes into even making those records somebody wrote those songs somebody has a talent for writing those songs I certainly never looked out my nose at a three minute pop song I think it's a really hard medium. To, to do something good in, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, but by the time it makes it to a record and it's so watered down, it just it, there's just nothing interesting about that, you know. Well, yeah, to fit radio play, I think to you know since most people are listening to pop music on the on the radio when they're driving around, they don't want to hear anything too complex, too complicated. You know, you're not going to hear film scores. I don't, radio. you know, I don't even think that's true. I think, oh. I think. If you listen to a record like um, like the Gautier single that was massive, right? Mm-hmm. Um, somebody I used to know, whatever it was called. I remember the first time I heard that, I was driving oh, yeah. back from a session, and I, I nearly rear-ended a bus when I heard it. I, I thought it was so great. And it's not, it's, it's not, you know, it was original. It was original in every way. You could tell how strong that guy's voice was, what, you know, what an original thought behind everything about that song the format of it, the, the form of it, you know, the, the, the idea behind it, the duet. And it was a massive hit. It's just, you know, I think most record companies, publishing companies, as has always been the case, and I think film studios can be the same way, they're about making money. So they know what makes money, and if one thing has made money, they'll, you know, copy it to death. Mm-hmm. And they don't deal generally in originality. To be an original, you not only have to break through, you know, all the musical noise, but you have to break through all the corporate noise too, just to be able to be heard. Oh yeah, and I've talked to death on the show about how, you know, basically the problem with the studio system, and I mean you can even say it filters into the music industry as well. Uh, we're just copying what works, what makes money, what's popular. And just doing it to death where it just doesn't become original anymore. When, in fact, doing something original is what I believe art in any form, cinema or music or painting even, to break. Yeah, convention. anything. Look yeah. At even, even look at Empire. It's not like that was, you know, original doesn't equal uncommercial. Mm-hmm. It's just somebody has to take a chance. Mm-hmm. And it's dumb because people, you know, studios, TV studios, film studios, record companies, they take chances every day on everything they put out. You're taking just as much of a chance putting out something that's completely asinine. Mm-hmm. Um, because safe isn't necessarily what people want to hear. 
it's this whole notion that audiences are stupid and they want to be talked down to is absolute bollocks. It's true. It's true. I mean, do you see anything in like when you look at a movie? Not as much. I'm, I feel like um, I'm sure How to Be Single is a phenomenal movie and, and people should see it because it's coming out February 12th. Um, but, um, you know, when you look at a show like Empire, do you think anything that's radical about that? Except for the fact that it's... I think at the time it, there was something radical about um, what Lee and Danny came up with. Yeah, this idea of a total soap opera that, you know, there's a there's a retro sort of element to it, I suppose, in some ways, but it's also so on the edge of what's happening, especially when it first started. It was, you know, it really was, it represented a lot of things that people were talking about, a lot of things that were controversial, LGBT issues, um, you know, sexism, racism, in and outside the hip-hop community, you know, it, and and musically it was doing something that was both familiar and new. So I think, I think you know, it was, if nothing else, it was ballsy. Mm-hmm. You've got to give it that. Right, right, right. Um, and, mm-hmm. you know... I take my hats off to anybody doing doing stuff like that, and and of course you know now, I guarantee there's a slate of shows that are just like Empire getting ready to getting ready to be launched. So if you're just tuning in, we're talking to Phil Eisler, he's the composer of the new film How to Be Single, as well as the show Empire. And so I guess Phil, in like so summing up things here, if the movie comes out uh, February twelfth, mm-hmm. and if there's any one big reason why people should see the movie, what would that be? It's just fun. Mm-hmm. It's a really fun movie. It's one of those things that, you know, it's one of those films where I think you can just check all the stress and the bullshit you've gone through that day at the door and just go and have fun. It's a genuinely funny movie. Mm-hmm. It's It's got heart. Um, it's beautifully shot. Score's all right. <laughs> you know, go yeah. see bloody thing. <laughs> putting, mo- putting it modestly. All right, awesome. Thanks so much. This is Phil Eisler. He's a composer of the movie How to Be a Single. So it comes out February 12th. So if you're into that kind of stuff, go see it. Thanks so much for being here, Phil. Appreciate it. All right, thank you.